two of Athena Rising, where we pose 36 questions to powerhouse female lawyers. Our guest today is the dynamic and talented Severia Harris, Vice President and in-house lawyer at Johnson & Johnson. On this episode, Severia talks about the importance of being your authentic self in all spaces, especially the workplace. We're so glad you're tuning into our podcast. Whether you're an Athena or an ally, welcome. Ladies, let's rise. Hi, Vanessa. Hey, Marisol. How are you? Better this week than it was last. <laughs> <laughs> last week was tough, but here yes. we are. It's another Friday. The weekend's upon us, and we're here with the lovely Severia Harris. Severia, thank you for joining us. Um, Severia and I met at Kirkland and Ellis back in the heyday. Um, she is a complete badass. So Severia went to Yale undergrad, went to Georgetown for law school, started her career as a litigation associate at Kirkland and Ellis. Were you in the DC office? The DC office. I was right? in the DC you office. Were in the DC office. I was in New York. Nonetheless, we worked cases together, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, after Kirkland, uh, Severia went to DLA Piper, where she was a partner, and now she's at Johnson and Johnson. She's been at Johnson and Johnson since 2016, and there she's equally a badass. She hosts the WLI, which is the Women's Leadership Initiative, and a blog, I believe, and podcast for that initiative, which she'll tell us all about as we're learning our new blogging skills and podcast mm -hmm. skills. So Marisol? Without further ado, Severia, here are your 36 questions. Thank First you. First one. Let's get into it. Yeah. That's right. And thank you for joining us, by the way. Um, you know, you have all the check marks of a phenomenal lawyer, Yale, Georgetown, Kirkland and Ellis, you're in house. Tell us what a day really is like working as Severia. Oh, gracious. Um, well, I think like so many women uh, who are badasses like yourselves, like you don't ever just do one thing. So I am usually starting with calls at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and the day doesn't tend to end, I would say, until around 12 hours later. But that's not all at, at J and J. Like that's because I'm a vice president at J and J in the law department. And so I've got a lot of calls associated with that and helping to sort of advise on new business strategies. Um, so that's been actually a shift. I used to do litigation. Now I sort of take that experience and help the business understand how to avoid risk. Um, but then I also have, you know, my extracurriculars and I was chair of the WLI corporate chapter. We now have a new chair who is phenomenal, uh, but I have a foundation of my own, um, which is the Unlock Foundation, which is really focused on professional women and reimagining the way they connect. So between the foundation and j and I've got a lot of calls um, and a lot of time spent advising, connecting, solutioning. It's exciting and exhausting. Mm -hmm. Sounds All like at it. once. All yeah. at once. But you're able to do it. So there you go. What's, yes. What was the biggest shift uh, that you had to make mentally in going from big law to in-house? Was it a business, putting on a business hat or what was the biggest shift? I actually will say, I think that being a partner at a firm um, helps one go in-house in a, in a really astonishing way in the sense that partners are business people themselves, right? They are responsible for business generation. They are responsible for minding numbers. And so coming in house, I actually felt like it it lent itself nicely because I was working with business people yeah. who themselves had to hit numbers and had business plans. And so I actually had a lot of sympathy and it actually <laughs> sort of, um, I felt like, let's do this. Like I'm a partner in this and let's help you come up with ways that are risk mitigated, but where you can hit your goals because I know what it's like having to sort of live and die by numbers. You just mentioned your foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the Unlock Foundation is launching on March 15th, Women's Equal Pay Day. And it that's is- That's right. That's right. I love that's it. Right. I love it. You know, yes. we like numbers, hence yes. 36. So we, <laughs> I like the significance of that. Yes, yes. So we had to pick something that was meaningful. And because- um, that foundation is centered on solving the social problem of the gap in women's net worth, uh, which stems from the pay gap. We wanted to start with awareness. Uh, and so we're, we're so fortunate. We already have in the pre-launch phase over 450 professional women members in seven countries. 
Wow. Representing over 300 companies. And um, it's just exciting. We've got so many great partners pulling up to help the programming. And it won't only be in New York. It's a New York nonprofit. Programming will be everywhere. So really look forward to seeing women sign up. It's free to join. It's free to come to events. Um, so it's really intending to have impact and be inclusive. So I think we're going to promise to sign up, join, so we want you in any way, and we'll be at your events. That's this fabulous. Is our, this is our public love, promise to you. I love it. I love it. This is the recorded commitment. Yes, <laughs> you've got so it. From us. That's I'm right. I always play it back when I. That's right. I'm like Vanessa, I haven't seen you. <laughs> yeah. I want. I want you ladies there, and we're looking to do something a little down in, in um, Miami as well. Yes. But that's a little bit of a teaser. I'll let you all think about what that might be. Well, the Miami market has blown up, so it's not just a, uh, it's not just a mm -hmm. beaches and palm trees, but you know, bring it. I mean, we're here for it. So Absolutely. you've done your own podcast. Uh, can you tell us what that experience was like? Wonderful. Yeah. So um, back in 2019, I got this idea for a speaker series that was for women by women uh, called Elevate. Actually, I was listening to, I had the idea for the series, but then I was listening to um, Level Up by Sierra one morning and um <laughs> that's a great song so, yeah. to the best of one's ability <laughs> and um she has this line where she goes I just keep elevating mm -hmm. and I was like you know what that's that's what I want the speaker series to be called elevate and so combined with the women's leadership initiative um employee resource group title it became WLI elevate and it really was all around women having conversations that transformed and inspired not about work, not about work, um, and really revealing the everyday heroes around us. And the format was unique enough that we were lucky to have so many incredible women pull up to be guests and participate in the conversation circle. Um, but I think they too were attracted to the opportunity not to be asked about their careers. I think especially the more visible you get, you get conversations and questions around your careers. And so to have someone like Serena Williams or Vera Wang come and be like, I'm not going to talk about work. Awesome. I just get to talk about life with other women and hear other women share about their life with me. They were marvelous. And um, we had 25 episodes for three seasons. It ended um, right at the end of 2021 at the after our 25th episode. But it was such a gift and really shifted me. Uh, in terms of recognizing this new passion I have around professional women. Sounds amazing. Um, you know, we have a lot of lawyers, hopefully, that are going to be watching our podcast, and uh, a lot of them are in private practice, and they all want to know, what, as an in-house lawyer, do you expect from your outside counsel? Uh, <laughs> rapid response. We'll start there. Okay, <laughs> rapid response. Um I think that this is this is like the real the real inside secret I'm going to give you. When you're at a firm your business model, you don't even realize it. Like a fish doesn't know it's in water. But like your whole business model is like taking a complex problem, running conflicts, opening up a client matter number and then like digging in and doing excellent, excellent, typo-free, perfect work and giving us a beautiful recommendation. And however long it takes, it takes. Although I know there are many late nights and weekends, but you know, it's kind of like the quality of the work is really here. When you are in house, it's like, uh, you know, it's like being parachuted into like an ER triage. Like you're just coming in every call, like, boom, like, you're like the doctor walking, like, what am I seeing? And like, someone's running, this is a situation. This, this, this. And your, your skill, right, is in knowing the questions to ask. And people want an answer before you leave the room, right? right. It's like when you go to the doctor. If you go to the doctor, maybe if it's very serious, you know, a doctor will say, we'll run some labs and we'll get back to you. But generally, when you go to the doctor, before you leave the doctor's office, you want a diagnosis and a prescription. You don't want the doctor to say, like, I'm going to open up a client matter number. I'm going to write them. I'm going to write a right. memo. I'm going to do some legal <laughs> research. Memo. I'm going to do some legal research. Do some research. The, yes. I really, it could be COVID. It could be Ebola. It could be the COVID. <laughs> you know, so many things, right? You, you don't, you wouldn't want that. And so- the speed differential when you're in houses, I could be on a conference call, I'll have a 
people emailing me while I'm in the conference call. And then I'll have someone IMing me saying like, hey, Severia, um, can I just get five minutes of your time? So when I reach out to outside counsel, I need a, a partner who gets it. And I have outside counsel who was a former colleague from Kirkland and Ellis uh, who supports me. And I email her, I text her. Uh, sometimes I've had to just straight call her and she's been phenomenal, but it's a, it's a, it, it is a speed difference between in-house and outside that I think until you experience it, it's hard to appreciate that pressure. And so to, to that point, I think friendships do help because I have a client who was a friend in a different capacity before he got very senior in-house. And it's different when you have a, a friend texting you saying, no, 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 no. Like, like the, the general counsel is asking for it. Like, nah, like the second, right now. And, <laughs> and, like right now and calls you and you're like, no, no, but I'm doing, re and he, no, just, you can caveat it, but just give me the answer, right? Mm -hmm. But if you don't have those friendships, if you don't have those friendships, right? And you're a woman and you're a woman of color, how do you get on those preferred oh, lists? Oh, Lord, let's talk about it. Let's, how how let's do you know that? Talk, how do you get on those uh, lists to get that? Mm -hmm. Let me say two things. Back when I was a younger lawyer, I went to a um, session on like mentoring session for young lawyers, young women lawyers. And there was a guy on the panel. I'm in the audience. There's a panel, all women, one guy, white guy. And he's listening to all the women talk about all the things, how hard it is to be a lawyer, a woman of color, a lawyer, the whole nine. And at the end, I'll never forget that this man said it because it was brilliant. I think he was like shell shocked. Like what <laughs> in the world are these people talking about? And he said, the one thing that I just am taking away from this is you have to have people invested in your success to succeed mm. in this profession. And the only way people are invested in your success is if they know you personally. And with all of these women in here talking about how they feel like they have to show up with a mask and they can't talk about their lives and they're not comfortable sharing about themselves. He was kind of like, I don't really know what the answer is because if you have that wall, no one's going to invest in you right. to care about your career. And that was a real unlock for me in terms of, I've got to start getting more vulnerable, more authentic, more willing to share about my life, which can be uncomfortable for women. And it can be uncomfortable for people of color and people who don't come from families, lawyers and their backgrounds and all of that. But unless people know your story, if all they know about you is that you do great work, they're not going to be invested in your success. And that's just the sad truth. You know, uh, Severi, I'll tell you, um, ever since I was a baby lawyer, I've been in, surrounded by by older male lawyers, and we are always taught, you don't share, you don't talk about, you know, you don't talk about your home life, you your don't, kids. your kids, your, you, you just, you don't share. So how, how did you do it? How, how did you become comfortable to make that change? I'm still not comfortable, I'll tell you, uh, completely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I just, so you know, I wasn't raised that way. I was raised in the sense of like, do great work. Right. And like, that's objective, right? Like, like if your stuff has a typo, that's object. That's an objective problem, like, right? Like this is a like, different Severia. Cause I can tell you when we work together, you weren't this open and authentic. And I love it. I love this. Thank you. you know? Thank you. So, I mean, I, I didn't, this is not where I came from. I definitely came from like a, you know, people should know your work and then your, your friends and stuff can know what, what you're, what you're like, like at home or whatnot. But when I went to this leadership program that, that J&J put me in for women called Ascend, um, the whole premise, you know, we came in, I was the only woman from the law department chosen to go. I thought like, oh, it's gonna be kind of like a business program, business leadership, but it threw out the rule book and it's hosted by, it's not just a J&J program. The host is, is out of South Africa. She's got a company, Liz DeWitt, look her up, she's phenomenal. But the whole thing is who you are is how you lead. And the whole leadership program was about authenticity and getting comfortable with your story. And that's what shifted for me of um, really just kind of realizing like your, whatever you're embarrassed about, ashamed of, think is a chapter in your story of life that you shouldn't read out loud. That's actually where, that's the outlet that people connect into. Nobody connects to perfection. They like it. 
but they don't relate to it. Well, because so it's an illusion. being honest is what works. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hear that. I think, you know, perfection is an illusion when you're honest with yourself about that. Right. And so as a follow-up to, to this question, to, to your answer about that though, I, I have a question about for young women. I feel like all of us are at a certain level in our career where we have proven that, you know, we get, we don't have typos. We can write, we can speak in front of an audience. We can try a case. We can do depositions. Do you th think that you can only be that true authentic self once you've reached that level in your career? Or do you recommend that for people, women, you know, young women of color starting out and they're like, nobody else in the room looks like me. How can I be my authentic self? I'm so encouraged by the young people. I was out with a young girlfriend last night and that generation, I don't know what they're called, the exennials, whatever they are, <laughs> they are so lit. And I, and I have to <laughs> say like, dude, like the way they even handle layoffs, right? Like these new terms, fun employment. Um, yeah, you know, they're like announcing yes. their layoff. Like, you know, we would all have heart attacks. Yes, yes, we died. Like, we would. Like everybody would. else, our generation, we like in the bathroom crying. Yes, yes. Like, you know, today I was laid off and I'm looking for new employment and these are my skills. And I'm like, what? So, I, you know, I almost say like, I don't know that our generation has the answers because we might, pull from the past yes. and try to put it on them but they're showing up to life with such courage and such optimism and are they going to get it all right no but did we get it all right no. no so you know i'm here for the new wave of people showing up and i'm also here for the inevitable pivot that it asks for from our generation and even people more senior to us to make space for it and not see it as unprofessional or not see it as like, you know, they'll never get ahead. They're going to get ahead. One day we will die off and they will be in charge. So <laughs> they're going to get ahead. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we can make space for that. I love it. They're bold. They are bold. They are. They're different than us. Um, what is, <laughs> what is the one thing that you love about being in-house? Ooh, I love being so close to the business. I gotta say, like, I thought I was gonna miss litigation. I actually still have like a little bit of a hand in it uh, in house, which has been a blessing. But there is a high that I only thought I would get from trying cases that comes with like program launches, product launches of like the strategy and the messaging and the figuring out all of the ways in which you're going to compete and win. See, business is still about competing and winning. Trials are about competing and winning. But business is the same thing. Who are our competitors? How are they placed? How are they messaging? How do we beat that? Um, so I love working hand in hand with the business to compete in the market. Okay, so what's been the most rewarding case issue that you've ever worked on? In life? Mm. In life. You can, yeah, go in life if you want. If you don't want to just talk about, you know, litigation, just you take the question how you take it. The HBCU case that I handled at Kirkland and Ellis, where we sued the state of Maryland for um, discrimination against its public historically black colleges and universities. And we sued them um, at, on two counts. One was program duplication and one was on um, funding. I handled the program duplication duplication claim it was special to me because I think I took like 40 depths in that case yeah, and that. and crossed and directed at trial our experts and we won on that claim and the, it was such a significant case they had to bifurcate damages from uh uh liability mm -hmm. and so I left Kirkland after we won on liability then they right. had to have a damages case uh, but Mike Jones, who was the partner who let it, kept me informed. And I saw it in the media and they ended up having to settle for um, $500 million. Wow. And wow. that just, I was literally like, if I tried not another case in life, yeah, which doesn't seem to be the case right now based on some other stuff is, is mm -hmm. now showing up at work. But I was like, in fact, that was the last, that was certainly the last trial I did. And I was like, if I don't try another case in life, I I I got my return from law school. That's awesome. Yeah, it's always nicer when you win and better. Yes, <laughs> especially Definitely. when you get a lot of money. Especially when you get a lot of money. Yes, especially for a good cause. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
now for the fun questions. We've we're done with all all the work stuff. Um because the audience wants to get to know you better and so do I. Um where did you grow up? California. Southern California. Ooh. I was about to say there's <laughs> you know you know my husband grew up in Berkeley and so in Oakland so he would tell you yeah y'all are different yeah we have to differentiate we're like New Yorkers North New Yorkers are always like but what part of New York right. like, yeah. you know, like so like north versus south so Southern California yeah are you from Albany or are you from the city come on I mean, exactly. you, know, you never know you never know exactly well what what was your favorite childhood memory growing up in Southern California Oh, um, in junior high, I had a, gr a group of really good friends, but um, specifically in the sixth grade, I joined a new school and, and two women who are still my friends to this day uh, became like my, my bosom buddies. And they, uh, we used to call ourselves the pink ladies. Like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> that was one of my favorite memories. Very cute. All right. So Grease was clearly one of your favorite movies, but um, what's your favorite 90s hip hop jam? Oh my gosh. And I was at a great spot last night where it was all 90s hip hop. Um, I'm going to say Crush on You by, um, what is that? Biggie and like Little Kim. I got to let you know that yes, I got a crush, crush on you. On you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That one. If you weren't living in the New York area, where would you live? Washington, D.C. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last thing you watched on tv and why glass onion because i like the i liked knives out and it's the same uh, uh, the same creator what one organization do you think it's important for women lawyers to join i think all women lawyers should at least go to one corporate council women of color conference it's yeah. a super empowering experience to see that many women and certainly that many women of color in one place. Were you there last year? I was not. I haven't been uh, since I've come to J&J. &J. You should go this year. You know it's in D.C. Oh. Yeah. yeah it's in D.C. and we are going to be there. We so are. So we expect to see you. But as oh you keep God, telling me, I have, have to go. Have to you you have to go. Now. You have to go. It's the yeah. best one. What's one thing about you uh, that would surprise people? They don't know. Um, that they don't know that would surprise them. Actually, I'm a very soft person. Yeah. Um, given the choice to have dinner with anyone in the world, dead or alive, who would you choose? Frida Kahlo. Oh, interesting. interesting choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you do in downtime? Oh, I do hot yoga. I play with my dog. He's like, I don't know where you migrate. He's over my shoulder somewhere on the ground. Um, I definitely love going out. Um, that, that I haven't grown out of that yet. I love going out to nice restaurants or hanging out with friends. And I definitely like to travel. So that's always on my calendar every year. Um, what's your favorite restaurant? So many. Um, for Charles Prime um, in the West Village mm -hmm. in Manhattan. What's one thing you'll never be caught wearing? Biker shorts. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> good one. So rare. <laughs> I'm so rare. So <laughs> uh, What's one vice you wish you could give up? Wine. Oh. Is that a vice? I mean, no. it's just girl, girl. <laughs> I just, you know, keep your heart young. <laughs> I don't even claim dry January. Like. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just let everybody else get on that truck. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> balance. Yeah, exactly. Yes, balance. That's exactly right. You're a new addition to the crayon box. What color are you? Oh, God. Um, I am a neon color. Okay. Any neon. <laughs> Any neon. Okay. When are you most inspired? When I'm alone. When I'm alone. Yeah. You said you love to travel. What's your favorite place to travel to? I went to Amalfi Coast this summer, and I think it's one of the most jealous heaven on earth 
heaven on earth places. I, I can completely understand why people go back again and again and again. If you weren't a lawyer, what would you be doing? I'd probably be a producer. Oh, of? Um, I'd probably be a, a movie producer. Yeah. What's your greatest personal accomplishment in life? Hmm. I think my greatest personal accomplishment has been getting out of my own way enough to show up as my authentic self and doing the work to own it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love it. Do you ever think you'll go back to private practice? No, darling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sk skirt suit or pantsuit? Skirt suit. You see, you're, <laughs> you and I, that's why. We <laughs> Define yourself in three words. Um, let's see. Passionate um positive and resilient what's the best advice you've ever received hmm best of oh gosh I get so much good advice I must say um all that glitters is not gold that's very true very true if you could switch lives with one person for one day who would it be Oprah Winfrey. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good one. She knew that. <laughs> I knew that. I'm, I'm just going to, like, I, I'm like, I, I like write, like, I want Oprah Winfrey to be my mentor. Like, I just like <laughs> this kind of stuff, like, out there in the universe. We'll see. Maybe one day. You know how much I love her. So, mm -hmm. yes. Um, what's one talent you wish you had? I could sing. Mm. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Mm. Ooh. so hard I I would say in 10 years I will be empowering women yeah and we look forward to that Thank what you. would you tell 20 year old Severia Oh my goodness. What would she tell me? Um, <laughs> uh, I think I would tell her. So 20 years old is I'm still in college. Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I would say you are going to have a lot of fun in this life. And so try to relax a little bit it's going to turn out just fine. And it's going to be on many days better than you could have ever prayed it. We love it. I like it. Well, we have to wrap up now. Um, we, did your, we did our 36 We did questions. our 36 and, and you've given us a lot of it, a lot of good tidbits and a lot of advice for young women. But if there's any, is, is there anything else that you'd like to tell young women uh, entering the legal profession? Especially women of color. Mm, you know, this is what I would say. And it's actually, um, I think Jay-Z said it. I like to quote rappers. That would I probably, was about to say, girl, I love people. I think that <laughs> would surprise people reasons. that I do quote him. And I've done it at work too. And <laughs> someone's like, did you just quote Tupac? And I, was like, <laughs> and I was like, yes, I did. He's like, I love it. Um, your talent will make room for you. And I think a lot of times we show up and we look around the room and we say, nobody here looks like me or nobody here has my story or whatever, but your talent is what made room for you. And it's going to keep making room for you in every room and every space as you go to the next level. So you don't need to look like everybody else or be like everybody else or sound like everybody else. Focus on your talent, develop your talent, guard your talent. And that is going to be your passport always and throughout your career.
I love it. Great and advice. I heart you. I heart you. It's been so I heart long you back. since I've seen you, but you're <laughs> still amazing and you're doing better than I could have ever imagined. Thank you so much. For Thank you so time. much for taking the time. Thank, Thank you, me. ladies. Thank you. Congratulations on this platform. It's phenomenal. I had so much fun. Thank you.